Hi everyone, it's me, Windsor Flynn. I'm back for another episode of Maternal Minds. In this series, um, I just bring on guests and women that I admire who are also um, sufferers or survivors of a mental health condition and they are also parents. So today my guest is Paige Bellenbaum. She founded the Motherhood Center and I'll let her introduce herself. Well, Windsor, it's a real pleasure to be a part of this today. Um, I'm always looking for opportunities to share my own story and journey with mental health and mental illness um, and also be able to share um, what I've helped to create as a result. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I am a licensed social worker um, and I am also the founding director and the chief external relations officer for an organization called the Motherhood Center that provides support and clinical treatment to new and expecting moms experiencing what we call perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. Acronym for this is PMADS and it includes everything from depression, anxiety, OCD, bipolar disorder, psychosis, PTSD, both during pregnancy and in the postpartum. So it covers the entire umbrella. Wow, that's so great. Um, I just am a huge fan of the Motherhood Center because, I mean, I if there was one available in California, I would have taken myself there like immediately. So I read a few of your background stories. Um, you're featured in Women's Health, Mother Muse, and a couple other um, media outlets. Um, but can you just share with us more about your personal experience with PPD? Yeah, so um, I have a 14-year-old son and a 12-year-old daughter. And for those of you who have little people out there, if you had told me 12 years ago that I would have teenagers, I would have said, no, that's that day will never come. These days are so long that I can't even begin to imagine what that will look like. And yet here I am. But I do remember and hold very dearly um, those first few months after my first child, my son was born 14 years ago. Um, when I look back in retrospect, I realized that my the anxiety was mm -hmm. mounting throughout my pregnancy. But I think as so many women experience, especially the first time around, it's hard to know what's normal and what's not, right? Like surely as women becoming mothers and being pregnant, we uh, are anxious, we're, cro we're growing a person inside of us, we're hypervigilant, uh, but looking back in retrospect, I was hypervigilant to the nth degree, which yeah. I share because it really laid the groundwork for my experience after my son was born. Um, I had a, a fairly traumatic birth, uh, and despite that, was allowed to leave the hospital less than 24 hours after delivery because it was a natural birth and they had no reason to keep me, although I wanted to stay for another three years. And uh, the onset of my anxiety and depressive symptoms were pretty much instantaneous. I would say that the anxiety led, and we see this a lot in women who have perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. Anxiety leads, and then when the anxiety starts to wear off, the depression sets in. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's actually, it's actually, um, it's, it's like a process. Um, I was obsessed with everything possible health related to my son. I, I was convinced that any glimmer or or reason for concern equaled that he was going to die like that's just the catastrophizing yeah. that my mind went to his poo was green um he was sleeping too long he wasn't eating enough like in my mind all of these things meant oh my god he's gonna die and i had this impending sense of doom that was gonna you know, happen to him and and couldn't sleep couldn't eat um had all kinds of breastfeeding issues was absolutely and utterly neurotic about everything. Uh, and when my anxiety started to kind of cycle down because my body just couldn't keep up with it, a very, very, what's that? It's exhausting. For those of you who experience anxiety or have in the past, it's really exhausting, especially when you're not sleeping and you're trying to care for an infant. Um, I was afraid of my son. Uh, I didn't want to be alone with him. I felt like I made the biggest mistake of my life. Uh, there were times where I, when I actually made it outside, uh, I would fantasize about just handing him to someone and being like, take this baby. I'm not fit to be a mother. 
I don't like him. I made a mistake. I just can't do this. Um, and, uh, you know, when they were sleeping, I remember, you know, kind of sitting in the, in the fetal position on the floor of my bathroom, just kind of looking at the medicine cabinet thinking like, I don't want to be here anymore. Like, I can't do this. How can I not be here anymore? Um, and the depression kicked in uh, and I, you know, started to have more and more of these thoughts of wanting to disappear. Uh, you know, one of the fantasies was to buy a one-way ticket to another country and just not come back and leave my son and my husband together because they were better off without me. Um, and it wasn't until one day um, where I finally dragged myself outside and we were walking down the street. I just remember everything looking very gray and just feeling like I wasn't even in myself um, and saw a bus coming. And I had this urge to jump in front of the bus. Um, and it was all I could do to hold myself back. But when I caught my reflection and the bus passing by, I saw somebody that I didn't recognize, um, but I knew that she needed help. And I put myself in a taxi and, and went to the Payne Whitney Women's Clinic, which was the only place that existed at that time that treated PMADS yeah. uh, and started to get the treatment that I needed to feel better. Wow. So did you already have a plan that you were going to go there? Like, or did the cab driver know where to take you? So I, you know, for those who have suffered from postpartum depression, anxiety, or any of the other diagnoses I mentioned, a lot of times it can render you paralyzed, mm -hmm. catatonic almost when it comes to completing tasks, getting things done. So, and this was six months after I had him, right? So even as a trained clinician who is educated and trained in recognizing symptoms and mental illness in others, I had no idea what was happening to me. Uh, and so in those glimmers of having the energy to really focus over that six months, I did research. I didn't know what it was called or what was going on, but I did research places that I thought could potentially be helpful. A lot of the places I called, you know, I would say, this is how I'm feeling. And then the clinician on the other side of the phone would say, it sounds like you have postpartum depression. And I was like, yeah, it kind of does. What do I do? And they would say, well, my initial evaluation fee is $1,500. And I'd be like, thanks, oh, bye. An insane amount of money. It's, it can be so expensive. So this place I had researched, I knew that this is what they specialized in. And it was out of sheer desperation where I just said, take me there. Um, and the cab driver took me there. I walked in. I was seen by a treatment team that evaluated me readily put me on medication and into therapy and slowly but surely I started to get better. So you, I mean, that's a lot to take in for people listening too, because I'm sure, you know, people listening have experienced something similar. Um, but when you say that you weren't able to recognize your own symptoms, I mean, were you alone a lot of the time? Like, did, was your husband able to recognize anything or your family? What did they think was going on with you? You know, I was talking about this the other day. Um, so I, I suffered very silently, although I thought everyone around me could see how loudly I was suffering. Mm -hmm. I did not share with anybody that I had thoughts of disappearing. Um, I, I cried every single day my husband left for work and he was only off for a week before he went back. I would literally hold on to his pant leg, begging him to not leave the house because I was so afraid to be alone with my son. Uh, I cried most of the day. I My son would only sleep in a sling on me. He refused to take a bottle for his entire life. To this day, I secretly haven't forgiven him. Uh, and so it was just me and him all day, sitting on an orange sofa, staring at the wall in a 365 square foot studio, being miserable. Um, and so my husband didn't really know what was normal or what wasn't. His brother's wife had also been incredibly anxious after they had their first. She bought a scale, she weighed the baby all the time. You know, So he was like, I don't know what is normal and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And I don't think my family, I mean, I think a lot of our immediate family, and I'll go so far as to say mothers and fathers come from a very different era um, where, you know, mental health was even more of a taboo topic than it is now. And so 
you know, when I would say I'm, I'm having a really hard time, oh, it's just the baby blues, it shall pass, you know, or I'm really not enjoying this. Oh, it'll, you know, that's normal. It'll go away. Just wait a few more weeks and then you'll start loving him unconditionally. So even when I did try to even like hint around the corners of what was going on, nobody could hear it and nobody really knew what to call it except for one friend of ours that came over one day um, with her husband and watched me with Max. And as she left, she said to my husband, she's not okay. There's something not right. You know, I I'm worried about her. Um, and I just reconnected with that friend actually a few weeks ago and was like, you were the one person who, kn who knew something was wrong. Like nobody else knew except for you. And I think that's the really unfortunate thing about PMADS. And, and I know that we've come somewhat of a long way, but still at least 50% of PMADS go undiagnosed because yeah. of the stigma and shame that surrounds mental illness and mental health in particular for new and expecting mothers. It is packaged and romanticized as such a very different experience. Yeah. And women are spoon fed this blissful, most amazing thing that's ever happened to you, this immediate unconditional love, you bring life into the world. And, you know, it's like you you produce breast milk like a fountain and you get your baby bo your body back. And that's, that's a, those are myths. And it might apply to like 0.5% of the child rearing population, but for the rest, mm -hmm. it doesn't go like that. And so when we don't feel those things, but we feel very strongly other things, we yeah. feel like we need to keep it a secret or else other people are going to judge us and think we're a terrible mom. For sure. Because it's not only that we think that people actually do think that you're a terrible mom. Like if you follow any, um, there's some postpartum depression accounts um, and the trolls on there are really awful. They'll say things like, why would you even have a baby? You don't deserve your baby to feel this way. People go their whole lives trying to have a baby and you didn't even want your baby. And it's like, whoa, okay. There's like a lot of anger and resentment behind that. Yeah. Also because people just don't know that it's a totally normal experience to feel totally like upended after you give birth. And then when you try to talk to family, at least in my experience, those family members are not always equipped to, to take on those conversations. Not everyone has a space to hear someone else's suffering and struggling, right? So it really becomes like this. It really feels like you there's no where to go or nobody to talk to because going to some place like the motherhood center or a psychiatric clinic often feels like it's a last resort, mm -hmm. but I think that we could reframe that and it can be a first resort. Like you can go there without it being a crisis. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's something that's so important and still unfortunately really missing. One of the components of care that we provide at the Motherhood Center is a day program. And this is a program for women that are really having a difficult time caring for themselves and or their baby. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we're in bricks and mortar and not in a pandemic, we have an on-site nursery. We have all kinds of wraparound treatment, support, expressive therapies like art therapy and mindfulness and meditation and yoga. And one of the things that moms will always say, not always, but pretty much most of the time, and it's an indication to me that they're getting better, is yeah. they will say, I'm mad. I'm really mad that nobody told me that this was going to happen to me. And so if we were able to, as a society, do a better job of providing education on the front end, then women and their families would be better prepared to acknowledge, recognize, and address it in real time so that yeah. we don't end up waiting six months or a year or the entire length between from a delivery of a first to the pregnancy of a second or third. And so it's that basic information that we do a lot of work trying to educate both OBGYNs, pediatricians, lactation consultants, doulas, anybody who comes in contact with a new or expecting mom, these are the signs of a PMAD. This is what you look for. If you think someone's struggling, here's some questions you can ask and here's some referrals you can make because without that information, then 
women don't know what to do and their families don't know what to do either, right? Like I'll oftentimes say, yes, it's important for women to recognize the signs and symptoms of a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. But as I just referenced in my own experience, when you're in it, you can hardly function, right? Mm -hmm. The depression and the anxiety is so acute that the things that you were able to do effortlessly in the best of times at your baseline feel like insurmountable mountains. So to put that responsibility on a struggling mom, hey, this is what a PMAD looks like. It's you can't sleep, you can't eat, you know, your mind is a hamster wheel, you're catastrophizing, you're having thoughts of not being here anymore. And by the way, you should reach out and get yourself some help on top of that. <laughs> like, right? here, on top of that, here's another thing that you need yeah, to do. Why don't you just get right on that? And so it's really important that partners know and that they know what to look for and what to do, as well as a woman's parents or other family members and friends. They're the ones that can throw in the life preserver and pull mom out of the water that she feels like she's drowning. And that's actually why our logo is a life preserver, because I always said after my own experience, I just wanted someone to throw me a lifeline and pull me out of the water because I, I was drowning and I needed somebody to pull me out. Um, yeah. So the more the more education we can do for everybody around a new mom, the better off she is at getting the help she needs and doesn't have to deal with that shame and stigma because we get to a place where PMADs are, and this is reality, the number one complication associated with childbirth and far exceed the rates of preeclampsia and gestational diabetes, which every woman is tested for and educated on. But I'd say maybe 10% now in this current iteration of being a pregnant or, or, expect, or new mom, only about 10% of them get information prior to what a PMAT is. And is this, is, are these statistics just for the United States? This is just for the United States. So there's a lot that in other countries. It's way more dire. Well, it depends. Well, um, the, UK it really really good. Good. the UK is really good about that. Yes, they are. They are a model country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, France and, and other European countries are very good. I mean, look, we've created, we've created a, a foundation that's lacking in supporting families in this country yeah. that also really sets the stage, right? Like we don't have, you know, six months to a year of universal paid maternity and paternity leave. We don't have universal child care and preschool and well, we do here in New York, but it's not a countrywide thing where child care is subsidized, right? Like already out of the out of the initial gates we're not providing families with the support they need to be successful and you know we're still far behind in recognizing mental health as a as as a multitude of conditions that are on the same level as physical health conditions it's the same thing but we are we are not there yet in the way that other countries are so i want to go back to um what you said about when women get better, they start to get mad. And just listening to you, you you sound so passionate about it, obviously, as we should be. I am also passionate about it too. But can we talk about how you took your anger about it to make the changes that you did? And um, can we share a little bit about the bill that you helped to pass in 2014? Yes, so I did. I started to get better with medication and therapy, and I too started to get mad. Uh, and this was right before, and kind of went on into the time that I found out that I was pre pregnant with my second, which was mm -hmm. went against all of the anything that you would think would would contribute to procreation. It was like almost an immaculate conception, but somehow it happened. And that's a whole other story for another day about how I managed to prepare myself for a second after this. But when I started to get angry, um, I have a public policy and community organizing and legislative background as a social worker. So I'd done a lot of work um, on a state level and a federal level, local level around passing laws and it wasn't in the area of health or mental health, but I, I was very familiar with the process. So I started researching what was out there 
by way of any kind of local, state, or federal legislation that addressed PMADs, either through education, training, screening, treatment. And at the time, there was a handful of states that had implemented legislation that spoke to those different categories. So I started to research them all and I started to draft model legislation based on those bills that were signed into law. And I created what I thought would be the paradigm PMAD legislation for New York State. And I approached a uh, state senator who I'd worked with very closely on a number of other issues like affordable housing and homelessness. And I said, look, Liz, I know you're busy. I know you've got a lot on your plate. Um, I wanted to let you know that, that this was my experience and that it's not just me, it's one in five women that are experiencing a PMAD and we need to do something about it. I totally understand if this isn't up your, you know, if this isn't in your, you know, arena of things that you're interested in. And I kind of backpedal and she was like, Paige, I read it, I heard your story, we're doing it. Mm -hmm. So for, a good three or four years, we fought very hard with the legislature to get the bill signed into law. It was originally vetoed in 2013. The governor felt as though it wasn't his job to tell the medical community how to do theirs. And really the primary components of the bill were mandatory education and mandatory screening for PMADs, education being given to women prior to leaving the hospital. And so we had to go back and, and have a fight with the legislature again. It finally was signed into law in 2014, and it does mandate education. So many of you who have delivered in the past, how long ago was that, seven years, might very well have received a pamphlet of some kind in your goodbye bag as you're being discharged from the hospital that says something about PMATs. That's the law. The problem is there's no oversight. So it's not mm -hmm. like the government, the state government has like secret spies that go out and make sure that every hospital's doing it. They don't have the capacity for that. So I don't know if it's happening everywhere. And then the language around screening was that it was strongly encouraged that OBGYNs and pediatricians are strongly encouraged to screen for PMADs at well visits and six week postpartum and pregnancy visits. It has a long way to go. It's a start. Um, but that was my first venture into kind of macro impact around PMADs. Mm -hmm. um, I then went on to organize a number of public events. I ran for public office. Um, it was very much a part of my campaign trail, mental health, um, maternal mental health. I did hold office mm -hmm. for a couple of years and just continue to do a lot around PMAD um, legislation um, and education. And then back in late 2014, early 2015, I was giving um, a, I was at the mayor's wife was unveiling this very robust platform of mental health initiatives called Thrive in My City in New York City. And I was telling my story at that press conference and in the audience was a woman who I had worked very closely with to get the bill passed, Dr. Catherine Berndorf, who is a world-renowned reproductive psychiatrist in the field of repro psych and PMATs. Mm -hmm. And I'd asked her to come, and when I stepped off the podium and went over to say hi, she was like, what are you doing right now? And I was like, Catherine, I wanna be doing this. Like, I've been doing PMAT education, all this stuff as a second job that I'm not getting paid for, that I'm happy to do, but like, I wanna do this 100%. She was like, well, why don't you come out to lunch with my partner and I, who's no longer with us. We have this idea. Um, mm -hmm. so I met them for lunch and the idea was the beginning of what the Motherhood Center is now. And so for a good three years, the three of us fought tirelessly to open the doors um, of the first ever Article 31 license New York State Department of Health and Mental Health facility that provides clinical and psychiatric care to new and expecting moms that are experiencing peanuts. That's so great. And also, it wasn't Catherine, um, you mentioned this in one of your stories, she was actually part of the team that had evaluated you when you went in for your postpartum depression, right? That's not full circle, I don't know what is. So <laughs> the day that I threw myself in a cab and went up to the Payne Whitney women's clinic, which is a clinic that Catherine herself started. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I have still to this day, I have no recollection of, of the women sitting in front of me. I, it's such a blur. I just remember holding my son thinking, can somebody here please just save me? Yeah. Um, we had a CBS reporter come to the Motherhood Center 
a few days before we officially opened. And she was the one who said, you know, it's really interesting, Dr. Berndorf, that Paige went to treatment in your program. Is there any way that you guys cross paths? And Catherine was like, I don't know, it's an interesting question. So she had somebody go dig through paper files, found my evaluation, and sure enough, there she was um, as one of the evaluators who signed off on my treatment. Um, and yeah, it still gives me goosebumps to this day. I know, that's amazing. It's an amazing story. Yeah. I love that. When I read, um, I was reading your stuff last night. Um, I just think that's so cool. And then especially that you teamed up together to create something like this. Um, I really think that it's a model clinic and I think it would be great. I mean, maybe, I don't know if you're up for it, but for opening more, you know, it's so needed. Um, especially I love the fact that you include reproductive psychiatrists in your clinic. Um, can you elaborate more on that? And also let's talk about all the other services that you offer with the Motherhood Center. Well, I, we would love to open up Motherhood Centers all over the US and beyond as well. Um, I will tell you, this particular model has never been done before. So we are a standalone clinic. We're not associated or affiliated with the hospital. Of this small handful of day programs that exist throughout the country, they're all embedded within a hospital. So they have a very different feel, right? Like if you can just imagine aesthetically, walking into a hospital to get treatment feels very different than walking into um, you know, a space that we created to feel anything but clinical. Um, we're still getting it right. We're still you know, figuring out how to be profitable. Um, mm -hmm. We're only just over three and a half years in, actually almost four. So we're a startup and you know, we're in our toddler phase. So we're still trying to iron out all the kinks. Once we do, let there be no doubt we will be in many other places. And I will say one of the things that the pandemic has done for us is allowed us to exist virtually um, mm -hmm. and to be able to treat people across state lines. In our support groups, I've had women join from Japan, Australia, the Netherlands, all over the US um, because they can. So it's pretty yeah. amazing. But to your point about reproductive psychiatrists, uh, reproductive psychiatrists, I wish there was hundreds of thousands of more of them. They are a very, very subset, small subset of psychiatry. And what they do is they specialize in meds in pregnancy and postpartum. Mm -hmm. They also specialize, you know, as Catherine would say, from menses to menopause and everything in between that applies to a woman's reproductive health and mental health. And so these, the, this type of psychiatry is very, very well versed in what is safe to take as a medication during pregnancy and postpartum. And unfortunately, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what is safe to take during pregnancy and postpartum. And I can't tell you how many times women will call and will do an initial screen, get some information, mm -hmm. ask if you've ever been on medication. No, I will never take medication during my pregnancy. No, I will really never don't take medication. And then they will not go to therapy because they don't want to be, to feel like they're being pushed. Right. right. And I think, you know, there's valid concerns about taking medication during pregnancy. That's a very, very personal decision. Mm -hmm. uh, what, we, what repro psychs can do is provide you with the reams and reams and miles of literature and research that's been conducted um, with pregnant women and lactating women and taking SSRIs and show you the unflappable research that has identified the fact that there are many SSRIs that, that, that have virtually no to little impact whatsoever on a developing fetus and virtually no pass through in milk if a mother's breastfeeding, right? And the, yeah. way, the way we look at that a lot is, you know, there, there's, it's a cost benefit analysis, right? Not to use a, apply business to, be, you know, being pregnant or, or, or having a baby, but there's also a lot of risks associated with not treating mental illness during pregnancy or postpartum. Yeah. If a woman is 
is is having a lot of anxiety during pregnancy, her cortisol rates are highly elevated, and that's having potentially a negative impact on fetal development that with an SSRI could be mitigated to bring cortisol levels down, mm -hmm. therefore having less to no impact on the child. Um, you know, the same thing goes for depression, right? Like if a mom is super depressed, she's not eating, she's not sleeping, she's not caring for herself, that also runs the risk of having a negative impact on the developing fetus. So these are, you know, we have to look at both sides um, to make a, a really educated decision. And then finally, to your question about what we offer, um, you know, we offer everything from education to treating acute PMADs and everything in between. So starting off on, on more of the educational side of things at the Motherhood Center, we do presentations left and right to OBGYNs, pediatricians, any practice or group of providers that come in contact with new and expecting moms, we tell them all about PMADs, we tell them how to screen, what to look for, how to refer to us. We do now in a virtual world, tons of like either one-off or series of support groups on other people's platforms, again, mm -hmm. to provide education and support around women who are struggling, especially in the pandemic. We have our own support groups that we run, PMAD support, um, pregnant women in a pandemic, we have a woman of color support group, a working mom support group. Um, we're about to start a single mom support group. So these are groups that meet virtually once or twice a week that are very low cost. And if there's any kind of financial burden, we will absolutely subsidize the cost of that for women that are struggling to join. But then more on the clinical treatment side, we do outpatient treatment. So we have a number of highly seasoned uh, clinical specialists um, that specialize in treating PMADs, both reproductive psychiatrists and therapists. So they do therapy visits, medication management. We also do trying to conceive visits and we're starting to get into um, miscarriage and loss because there's just yeah. so much of that. It's so untouched too. It really is. And then finally, what we're really, really known for is the day program, which I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And the day program is an intermediate level of care so it's a step up from outpatient and it's a step down from inpatient. In, in rare but acute instances, women have to be hospitalized. If they are experiencing psychosis or if they're experiencing severe depression and are a threat to themselves and others, that is required hospitalization. Um, those numbers are underreported. So we see a lot of women being transferred to us from inpatient stays. That's a whole other body of research that I would like to have done because psychosis is a lot more common than I think the numbers suggest. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like one or two and two thousand. thousand or something. And I would say, now granted, we're the only game in town that treats psychosis and we're in New York City, but I'd say on average about 20 to 25 percent of our day program population is recovering from psychosis. So that's a pretty sizable number when you compare it to a one in a thousand. But in the day program, women are with us five days a week, now three to five hours a day. It really depends on the specific plan we put together for them. They participate in therapeutic support groups. So we call from um, highly um, efficacious modalities like cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy. Um, everybody's followed by an individual therapist, reproductive psychiatrist. We offer expressive therapies, art therapy, mindfulness and meditation, um, yoga. Uh, we also have family sessions and couple sessions so that partners and dads can be well-versed and understand what mom's treatment plan looks like mm -hmm. and they can get the what they need around being a couple through this process. We have a partner support group that dads and partners come to every Friday to find a sense of community and support around what this is like for them. Um, and then we have our virtual nursery that used to be a real nursery in bricks and mortar, but we have a baby whisperer director who can help you with anything from eating to feeding to sleeping, you name it. Um, moms get all of their, their needs met in this very comprehensive level of care. It's like a one-stop shop. Yes. I love it. Yeah. Because those little things too, like the feeding questions, the sleeping questions, those are all really weighted because depending on who you ask, you get a different 
um, answer. And a, a lot of the answers are not really mom focused. So it's not really putting the mom's needs, which are really important. And usually nobody cares about that. It's not putting the mom's needs at the forefront. So maybe the, someone might highly suggest, well, maybe you should just sleep train right now. Just, you have to do it. You have to do it. And then the mom, like me, some, pe some people can't do that. It's really oh. hard. It's super stressful. Yes. And it just escalates everything. So, like, I love that you have people who have the mom's needs and the baby's needs really, like, at the same level who can help answer those questions because all that stuff contributes, right? It's a totally holistic approach to caring for a mom and baby. You know, I will oftentimes ask moms to really think about um, the very first thing that happened to them that opened the floodgates and invited their PMAD to rush in. And almost invariably they can think back and remember one comment or statement that came typically from a medical provider, but sometimes friends or family that 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 kind of stamp them with this perspective of, I am failing, I'm not doing this right, I suck at this. I've heard numerous stories, and this is not to say that all nurses fall into this category because we have amazing nurses that are on the front lines doing a wonderful job. Every once in a while, you know, someone will be told, you know, in the immediate postpartum in the hospital, like, what are you doing? That's not how you nurse or, you know, some comment that just like sends mom into this spiral of I'm doing this wrong. And then, you know, the PMAD has an open invitation to kind of rush in. And another thing that you said made me think about, there's this statement that, that we throw around a lot. It's the, the pregnant princess and the postpartum pauper. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as you probably experience, and so many women do, when you're pregnant, you're the center of attention. Oh my goodness, how many women are you? Is a boy or a girl? How are you feeling? Oh, this is what happened to me. Oh, do this, that, and the other thing. The second that baby comes out, mom is like third tier on the on the. Asks about you. Only, how's the baby doing? How's yes. your baby? Let me see the baby. And you're like, meanwhile, you could have like tears running down your face like, and you look like you haven't showered in weeks, and everyone. Just show me the baby on the phone. Yep, yeah. Like, I still exist. Exactly. Not only do I still exist, but I didn't only just give birth to a baby, I gave birth to a mother, right? And mm -hmm. guess what? I've never done this before. And I just, I, you know, we just did a post on Instagram on Sunday about all the research that suggests that that mothers are not, we do not have this genetic maternal instinct. It's not something that we're born with. We have to learn how to be a mother just like fathers have to learn how to be a father, right? It, it's not yeah. something that we innately know how to do. And so with all of that it's shifting- That there is, it's presented like your motherly instinct, like you'll know that baby was inside of you, you'll know what to do. And their dads are given this, they have a, a long time to catch up. Like a few years, people will be like, he's still learning. Meanwhile, you are a mom and you're having trouble in a few weeks and it's like, well, maybe she's just not up for it. Maybe right. motherhood just wasn't meant for her. And it's like right. really extreme. Right. And I also think one of the things that is complicated in this day and age compared to when our parents were parenting is that, you know, on the one hand, it's great to have access to information everywhere you look and to have, you know, the good old internet available. On the other hand, it can be really dangerous. Uh, and, you know, as anxious mothers, we can find absolutely anything we're looking to substantiate online, either for in the best case scenario or the worst case scenario. And all, most often we choose the worst case scenario and we're anxious about something, which makes us feel even more anxious. So there's information everywhere, not only that could be detrimental, but also to your point about sleep training, there's like hundreds of sleep training methods, right? Or just yeah. how to get your baby to sleep, right? Like go on Amazon and type in baby sleep and there's probably like 30 pages of options. So if you're a new mom, who's trying to determine the best sleep improvement option for you, how do you even make a choice, right? Like when my mom was raising me, and granted, I'm probably older than most of your viewers, but there was one book 
and it was Dr. Spock's sleep book, which is such a creepy <laughs> name for a book. He one sounds book. Like, yeah, like a Star Wars person. Yeah. But one book, that's all anybody used, right? Back in the 70s, I don't know what they did in the 80s. But I mean, on the one hand, how much easier to have one way of doing something, right? Then we don't mm -hmm. run into like, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what to choose. There's a million different sleep specialists who have a million different approaches. This person is doing it that way. This person is doing it that way. What do I do? And then we're paralyzed and we can't make a decision because there's so many choices to make. Yeah, I totally relate. I feel like that is one thing that I hear a lot too. It's like, well, I don't know if I'm making the right decision and then when you feel like you can't make a decision, that takes away a lot of your power, right? And then there goes that feeling again of that you're not able to do it. And other people are able to choose. Other people are doing things and I can't. And it just reinforces this idea that, you know, we're failing or, you know, it's just so hard. I talked to another person yesterday, not yesterday, but um, for another maternal minds. And we spent a lot of time talking about the internet and Instagram and like how to still take the positive parts and kind of like throw away the negative aspect of it. But it really contributes a lot to mental health and just how people view themselves with all the comparing and contrasting. And you have these accounts that are dedicated to like, showing the best moments of motherhood and everything has this beautiful filter and the mom always has makeup and the kids have matching clothes and you can see the floor and it's like that's not what's going on here I, it's a lot to process it's usually nine times out of ten not what's going on in a new or expecting mom's life and i like what you're saying like try to hold on to the good but also recognize that there can be a lot of kind of detrimental images and messages that that mm -hmm. swirl all around us and i kind of lump them into something i referenced earlier this glamorization of motherhood um, and it makes me want to share a story that i've shared a lot many times and i think it's powerful now back in the day when my son was a newborn 14 years ago believe it or not facebook and all those things didn't exist but Moms still were trying to keep up their appearances to the yeah. best of their ability to show other moms in person, you know, or in photographs that like they had it all going on. And so when I was at my very worst, um, it was probably around the two or three month mark with my son. And I literally hadn't been outside. It was the heat of New York summer, hadn't been outside, was wearing the same outfit that I'd had on probably for a week. Um, had been holed up without any AC in my studio, just losing it all over the place. And was like, I gotta get outside just to get some fresh air. I'm just gonna walk to the park and come back. So I walked to the park and I remember walking by all of these moms of like infants, toddlers, children, interacting, playing, smiling, enjoying their time or seeming to with their little people and feeling like Sea Page there's like 20 more reminders of how much you suck at this and how much you should not be doing this. Look at how everybody else is doing it right and you're doing it wrong. And I sat down on a, on a bench and just kind of stared out into space. And out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of this really beautiful woman walking towards me, you know, in bright colored outfit, had a baby strapped to her. She had beautiful hair, makeup on, was smiling, was like walking close to my bench. And I was thinking to myself, don't get anywhere near this bench. This bench is for like unattractive, worthless, failing mothers. <laughs> You're not allowed to sit here. We don't belong here. Her. I'm like, if she's like, I don't have anything to talk to this woman about if she sits down next to me. But sure enough, she came, sat down, she looked over, took her baby out. Baby was smiling, cute. Meanwhile, my son was covered in baby acne, hidden in this, in this this thing in my chest. And she was like, oh, you have a baby too? I said, yeah, you know, how old? She said, isn't this the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? And I looked at her and I was like, no. <laughs> said, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And a lot of the time I wish I'd never done it. And her beautiful smile started to fade and she started to cry. And she said, thank you so much for saying that. I feel the same way. 
And I think that's such a powerful story because no matter what we see, but no matter what we see on the outside doesn't tell us anything about what we see on the inside. And I will tell you some of the most well-dressed, put together women will walk in when we're actually at the motherhood center, sitting on the sofa and we'll be like, is that a reporter? Or like, is that, you know, is that like the queen of England? And it turns out to be one of our illest patients, right? Like we feel mm -hmm. so much pressure to exude this exemplary, you know, what we think we're supposed to look like and personify as new mothers when we are just miserable inside. And so, you know, I, I wanna invite everybody. We just had this week long challenge um, last week and it, it was all about the, you know, motherhood is messy. And so we had all of these photographs and posts about what motherhood actually looks like. So I would welcome, it's a call to action for all of you that are watching right now. I, I dare you to share a picture of yourself that's less than perfect. Because when you do that, you give other women permission to not be perfect also. And you normalize the experience of what motherhood actually looks and feels like. And then we begin to start a movement of normalization where we don't set women up, new and expecting moms for failure, but we set them up for success because they know that it can be hard and wonderful at the same time. And they know that they're not an awful person if sometimes the hard outweighs the not so hard. Yeah, I love that. I especially love how, I mean, your story speaks to it perfectly, but when we really talk about our struggles and the, our own reality, we are giving permission for other people to do the same. Yeah. And let's take some of the struggle out because it's so hard to keep up appearances and there's a lot of pressure to do so and just being told that you're allowed to cry on a public bench to a stranger is just i think it's really relieving and it's really powerful because then only when you're showing your true self can you create these real connections and that's how we can start the healing process Okay, so we're almost, we're hitting like our 50 minute mark, but I just wanted to, we've talked about so much that I really wanted to cover, you know, medication during pregnancy and breastfeeding and how you've done so much out of your initial anger and suffering in the beginning. Um, for moms who don't have access to this type of center that you provide um, and who may be experiencing severe symptoms, what would you suggest their um, plan of action be? So uh, back in the 80s, um, our mothership of everything PMAD related opened uh, and it's called Postpartum Support International. Mm -hmm. And over these many, many years, they have worked tirelessly to establish coordinators in every uh, city, state, um, and country, pretty much around the world, of PMAD specialists who their primary job is to connect women that are struggling and looking for support and care to treatment providers in their immediate community. And so, They've got, you know, multiple coordinators in, in some, you know, in some large cities, but everybody's got someone. And so yeah. women who can't necessarily access the Motherhood Center for whatever reason, check out Postpartum Support International. And uh, they, they are very user friendly. You can click on the map, let them know where you are. A page will come up of coordinators in every city in that state. Uh, and then once you reach out to that coordinator, they'll help connect you to the care that's more local and right in your community. They do trainings, they do support groups, they have partner support. They are such an incredible resource and they're entirely free. So that's really the place that, that we send everyone and anybody um, that might kind of fall out of our jurisdiction. Great, so I put that on the banner there. So everyone can know Postpartum Support International. They also have an Instagram, but they're not so super active. No. On the Instagram. You know, their chapter, some of their chapters are active. Like we have a lot of connections with like Postpartum Support International Utah, but yeah. they're, yeah, they're, you know, like 
like me, and I don't mean to date myself. I'm really not that old, but you know, they've been around yeah. for a while. Yeah. So yeah. Social media, yeah. like not a geriatric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, I just want to thank you so much for coming. And I feel like I've learned so much and also I've just been super validated um, by hearing your story. And I'm sure many people viewing will feel the same way. Um, and also thank you for creating the Motherhood Center. I think it's such a great resource. Like I just want to shout it to everybody who is in New York that this exists. Um, and I can't wait to see what you do in the future. Well, thanks, Windsor. Thank you so much for having me. And I guess the parting words that I'd love to leave with your viewers are, um, and I and we, you know, we, we borrow this from Postpartum Support International, is that you're not alone if you're suffering. It's not your fault. And that with treatment, everyone can feel better. That is the most hopeful thing to know about PMADS. If they do affect you or someone you know, they are absolutely treatable. Whether it's therapy, therapy and medication, day program, support group, these therapies and interventions work wonderfully. So don't wait. If you think something's off and you think you're not feeling like you should, or you're just in so much distress, mm -hmm. the first best step is to find out, try to get an evaluation, try to contact, you know, us, even if you if you can't come to us for whatever reason, we will connect you with a wealth of resources. Yeah. Let's find out first what's going on and then treatment easy peasy. And then you get to be the mom that you really want to be. You get to enjoy that valuable time with your infant, your toddler, toddler your children. Um, and feel good. And that's really what every mom desires. Well, you heard it from Paige. It's very possible. And I think it's really important. Yeah, just to stress that it is so possible to feel better. Because when you're in it, it feels like there's no end in sight. It just feels like an awful hole of desperation. But you can totally turn it around. Yeah, you can with the right help you. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for listening, you guys. And thanks again to Paige. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, Windsor. Thanks, everybody.